Prologue Pallas looked out over the sea, her blue eyes flitting across the horizon as the moons crept into view. The sun was setting. Soon the stars would burn bright in the heavens, and the distant planets would come into view, faded dots of light deep in the void of space. It seemed fitting that CX-12 would watch over her as she left her last mark on Agar. She took a step back, her old knees aching with the movement. She folded her soft, weathered hands as the wind tousled her silver-white hair. She wasn't sick or senile, but she could still feel her end was near. She felt ancient. She was one of the last on Agar who still remembered the beginning, the first colonies, the first landings. She was one of the only ones who remembered a time when Agar didn't have a name. Her heart was heavy and weak. The attitudes and stories were changing. Countries were forming. The people were dividing. She could see bits and pieces of what the future held, and it terrified her. She had to act. Are you ready? The ship rocked slowly as Palas turned to the circle. Five men and four women waited for her, standing around a metal canister the size of her head. Carmen tinkered with the device, working up until the end to ensure it wouldn't crack or erode. Yes. Paulus moved forward to join the circle. She closed her eyes. Despite her age, her mind was perfect. Her memories were almost too clear for her liking. But there were some things she had tried to forget. Moments in time she'd have to draw on again if she was to use the abilities she'd been gifted by Agar to send her message. Her fingertips trembled as she joined hands with the circle. The young men on either side of her glanced at her with concern. She could feel their nervousness as they questioned what they were about to do. She grit her teeth and steadied her hands. She needed them to be as firm in their conviction as she was, or everything would fall apart. Carmen stood and closed the circle. She caught Palas's eyes, sending her certainty and calm through their sight connection. They had only met a ten moon ago, but Carmen had quickly become the daughter Palas never had. When you're ready, connect with the Lifestone core in the device. Focus on what you want to say, what you're feeling, what memories you want to imprint on the core. We'll use what abilities the site has given us to help you focus. Paulus closed her eyes once more, calling on the site to help her go back, to remember what it was like before. She could taste the cold, processed air of the colony where she'd been born, a bloated pod floating in space, looking for a home. She could feel the gusts of a shuttle landing, the dust and pine needles flying through the air and clinging to her hair. She could see the glint of the sun off the tin roofs of the temporary shelters. She could still see the glint in Athena's eyes when they thought they'd be safe. She remembered everything in excruciating detail. She painted the memories with her thoughts and impressions, her warnings and fears. Tears streamed down her cheeks, and her breath came shallow and gasping to her lips. She started to lose control of her focus, her memories returning over and over again to Athena's face, her eyes, the feeling of her hands on her skin. She fell to her knees, pulling away from the circle and holding her hands tight over her heart. I can't do this anymore. Carmen kicked the latch to the capsule closed, sealing Palas's memories inside as she fell to her knees, holding her friend. Palas, Palas, are you all right? Palas held tight to Carmen's arms, but her senses of the other woman were quickly fading. Athena stood out in her mind. Her Athena. Her lost Amazon. It's done. One day they'll know. 
One day they'll hear our whispers out of time. Palas's words were slurred, barely audible. Carmen held her tighter, but Palas felt herself go weak. She didn't care as she lost all feeling in her body. She didn't see the tears flooding Carmen's cheeks or hear the frightened gasps of the circle. There was only Athena. Finally. The message was cast. She had given every bit of herself back to Agar, and in return, the planet had released her soul back where she wanted most to be. Somewhere in time, the future would find her last message of hope, her greatest truth. She hoped it would be enough to stall the things she'd seen. Athena smiled and reached out for her. Pallas took her hand, the wrinkles and age disappearing as they clasped hands. She couldn't care about the future anymore. She was going home. Part One Songs of Destiny Chapter One The jungle threatened to swallow her whole. Long, wet vines tugged at her arms and legs, stinging her cheeks as she ran. The sky cracked overhead with a boom of thunder, sending an electric shock through the humid air. But there was no rain or wind. The choir wouldn't allow anything as trivial as the weather to disrupt the chase. Reeve dodged sharply to the left, splashing and plunging into a thick swamp. The mud swallowed her to her neck, coating her pale skin and short, dark blonde hair. It masked the musk of her sweat, burying her in an earthy, sulfuric scent that seeped into her nose and coated her tongue. She gasped for breath, her sides cramping and her muscles screaming as she allowed herself a moment to rest. The song hadn't found her yet, and there was enough living in the marsh to confuse it for at least a few breaths. The wet soil was a blessing to her battered bare feet. Her boots had worn out long ago, and running through the rugged jungle terrain had left her soles bruised and bloody. It was easier to tread mud and swamp water than to race over spindly tree roots and thorny vines. She closed her eyes, trying to refocus her thoughts. Her heart pounded wildly in her throat. Large beads of sweat rolled down her face, the salt stinging the shallow cuts across her cheeks and the broken skin of her dehydrated lips. Her stomach rumbled and ached, empty for days. She didn't know enough about the jungles of Karatan to safely forage for food, and the last of her supplies had been used long ago. She was lucky to even find fresh water. A soft, whistling melody echoed in the distance. Reeve's pale blue eyes flew open, wide with fear, as they flitted across the swamp. The jungle was too still. The animals had retreated hours ago, and with no breeze or rain to rustle the trees, the only sounds were the crackle of thunder and the deep, wet suck of the mud clinging to Reeve's tattered clothes. But she had heard it, the approaching song, spreading out across the landscape, hunting her. She couldn't rest any more. She pushed forward, leaving heavy ripples across the swamp's surface. She didn't think about her empty stomach, her lacerated feet, or her steadily dwindling energy. All she thought about was the mountain, the crumbling ruins high enough to be surrounded by the buffeting winds that would keep the song at bay. The mountain Reeve had seen every night in her dreams since leaving the desert far to the north and trekking into the tangled wilderness of Karatan, the mountain that would take her one step closer to taking down the choir for good. She pulled herself out of the other end of the marsh, crawling like a beast on her hands and knees until she was free of the swamp. Her limbs trembled as she pushed off the ground. The whispers of the song were growing louder. She glanced over her shoulder as a ghostly white mist floated slowly across the swamp. Reeve didn't know anyone else who could see the songs, the nanobots formed by the choir to control everything from the weather to the minds of the people of Agar. They were usually gentle, twisting and turning the forces of nature and human thought with a barely perceptible hand. 
Reeve doubted such a painless fate awaited her if the song reached her. The cloud of song traveled faster, catching her scent in the wrinkles of the mud. Reeve sped into the jungle again, drawing into the deepest wells of her energy. The jungle became harder to traverse, the knotted rolling roots of the ancient trees making the ground uneven and unstable. The song was getting closer, the mist engulfing the trees without slowing. Reeves stumbled over an exposed root and nearly hit the ground. Her head ached, the muscles in her neck contracted as the song drifted closer. The cuts in her feet and legs split, blood beating across the cracks and rolling down her skin in tiny rivulets. The mud on her back began to dry and harden from the heat of the song. Reeve wondered if it intended to set her on fire. Reeve turned sharply to the right, hoping to confuse or outmaneuver the nanobot cloud, but it had caught on to the fringes of her trail. It would continue following her until she could reach wind, the only natural phenomenon the choir couldn't control, and the songs couldn't pass. Reeve pressed against the trees, willing herself to disappear, to be invisible. She wanted to meld into the shadows and pray the song passed her by. She merged with the darkness, becoming silent and nearly untraceable. If her hunter had been a creature, even a human, she would have seemed to disappear. It was one of the many skills and gifts she'd had from birth. Reeve started to gain distance, the song finally growing fainter, and eventually disappearing. She slowed her pace, fighting to catch her breath. She couldn't see the sky through the dense leafy canopy, but the shadows were deepening, stretching longer across the ground like ink stains. Night was falling, and while the songs would stand out even better in the darkness, traveling through the jungle would become even more perilous. The silence stretched on as the jungle's elevation slowly increased hills giving way to the base of her mountain. She was used to the stillness. Few living things would come near anyone marked for death by the choir, and the more sentient residents of Agar would kill her on sight for her eyes. The silence didn't touch her, except in the darkest moments of her despair. Reeve had been used to the silence long before the song started pursuing her. She was born in darkness, in quiet. It was all she knew, all she trusted. It could be a blessing. She rarely feared wild animals or poisonous insects. Even predatory plants shied away from her. Still, there were quiet moments when she had evaded the songs long enough for a night's rest or had found a patch of wind that would keep the choir at bay, when she wondered what it would be like to have a companion. But it was a dream. Even if she blinded herself, clouding her damning blue eyes, the songs wouldn't stop. No one would be willing to spend a life fleeing with her. A travel partner was a liability. She would only end up abandoning them when they inevitably couldn't keep up. Reeve stumbled over a thick, thorny vine and fell hard to the ground. She winced as the thorns tore through the thin cloth of her pants, slicing her shins. She carefully freed herself from the spines and sat hard on the ground, her fingers probed the fresh cuts. They were shallow, barely bleeding, and she couldn't see any sign of discoloration in the dwindling light of day. If the thorns had been venomous, she'd know soon enough. Reeve smiled grimly, her thin lips quirked with dark humor. It would be a fitting end to her story, to die in the depths of Karatan from a venomous plant. At least the choir wouldn't have the satisfaction of being her end or pushing her to killing herself. Reeve turned to push off the ground, and her hands grazed a broken shard of pottery. She hesitated, grabbing the shard and running her thumb over the sharp edges. She looked up into the darkness with an irrational glimmer of hope. Perhaps there was a settlement nearby, with food, water, and a clean change of clothing. Perhaps even boots anything to make her climb up the mountain easier. She struggled back to her feet and ran. She soon found a narrow trail formed by hundreds of feet and machetes clearing back the jungle. She pounded down the carefully carved pathway through the towering twisted trees until she reached the village. Her hope vanished, 
carrying with it the last of her energy. The village was long abandoned. There was nothing to help her. No food, no water, not even animals in cages to distract the song. She fell back against a slender, rough tree, her knees trembling, ready to buckle. She hadn't expected how hard losing such a tiny thread of hope would hit her. This is why you don't hope. You don't think. There is nothing for you. There is only the mission. Reeve shook her head. She didn't have time for this. She couldn't be weak. She had to run. She'd already run so far. But she couldn't seem to find the strength. She was a shell of a woman, shattered and empty. If the song found her, there would be barely anything left of her for it to take. She clenched her hands into fists. This wasn't the time for self-pity. It was never the time for self-pity. Suddenly, a deep, vicious snarl echoed from the other side of the village. Songs were light and airy, mournful and distant. They lulled the populace into a false sense of security. They didn't growl. Reeve crept toward the sound, welcoming any sign of life, even an aggressive one. She paused. A forest wolf snapped at an ancient steel trap clamped around her paw. She gnashed her teeth and whimpered as she struggled to get free. Her ebony and silver fur stood on end, her slender ears pressed flat against her head. Calm down, calm down. Reeve's voice was infused with a deep calm, aided by her natural empathic abilities. The wolf watched her, the canine's deep golden eyes wary and full of pain. As the animal calmed, Reeve patted her head, stroking between her ears and scratching her neck. Reeve closed her eyes. She couldn't remember the last time she'd touched something so soft and warm. Her touch whispered truths to Reeve in snippets. The wolf was female, born far to the north. Her paw was sliced, but not broken. The trap was too dull to sever her limb, but she'd been stuck for more than a day, and her struggling had only made her injuries worse. She was just as hungry as Reeve, but she had no intention to attack her rescuer. Reeve knelt beside her and struggled to ease the trap from the creature's leg. The metal teeth were dulled from years of disuse, but they were slick with the wolf's blood. Reeve tensed. She could hear a deep, sorrowful melody echoing in the distance. This one was different from the one in the swamp. A new song. The melody was urgent beckoning, willing her to stop running, to quietly wait for death. The tune was clouding Reeve's brain, weighing her down, like the blissful warmth before freezing to death or drowning. She bit her lip until she tasted blood, focusing on the pain. She had to get away. The new song would soon call the other to join it, a pack instead of a lone wolf. If she didn't run, it would find her. She grappled harder with the trap, the hinge slowly easing back. The wolf yelped with a mix of pain and relief as the pressure on her leg eased. She withdrew her paw and stumbled back, limping away from the trap with another snarl. The song was getting louder. She could see the fog of the nanobots seeping into the village, lingering for a moment around the tree where she'd rested. The wolf whimpered, not from pain, but terror. Reeve regarded her with surprise. No animal feared the songs. The songs only whispered to them, showing them where to nest or bidding them to clear away from populated areas. A wolf would have no reason to fear the songs, or even give them more than a passing notice. Reeve shook her head and fled once more, speeding toward higher parts of the jungle. As long as she continued to travel higher, she was on the right path. To her surprise, the wolf sped after her, keeping pace even with a wounded paw. You won't escape the songs by following me. Reeve's voice was soft and raspy with disuse, barely a whisper over the heady, beckoning song. If you run, you'll be safe. The wolf regarded her slowly, almost as if she understood Reeve's words, but her pace never slowed. 
Reeve felt a flash of guilt in her stomach, but she shook her head, casting it aside. It wasn't her fault if the beast wouldn't leave her. It wouldn't be her fault if the wolf fell behind and was consumed. The rhythmic tones of the song from the marsh drifted toward her, its rolling fog spilling over the ridge in front of her. The tune melded with the song from the village, creating a dark, warning melody as they sped after her. The wolf howled once to the sky and took off away from the encroaching songs. Reeve had no choice but to follow. Reeve felt as if she had lifted from her body as her focus narrowed. She couldn't feel the pain or the weakness in her lean muscles. There was only the race, one foot landing in front of the other, and a vague awareness that she had to keep moving higher. Thunder crashed once more, harmonizing with the songs as they intensified. The choir wasn't trying to lull her to them anymore. The facade of peace was abandoned. The songs hissed, boomed, a roared threat about what would happen if they overtook her. Their message was simple. Give up. Give in. You can't run. We control everything. We control everyone. You are chaos. You will be destroyed. Reeve's foot caught in an upturned root, and she pitched forward, hitting the ground hard. She cried out in pain as she threw out her hands to brace her fall, and the middle finger on her right hand snapped. Her body was fragile, too weak from malnutrition and exhaustion to absorb a blow. The wolf spun back around, racing to her side and grabbing Reeve's sleeve in her mouth. She pulled, desperate for Reeve to follow. Reeve locked eyes with the beast and was shocked to see fear and concern. Why would she already see Reeve as worth saving? There was more to the forest wolf than met the eye. Reeve stumbled back to her feet, holding her broken hand in the other. The wolf growled at the oncoming songs, her lips curled back from her teeth, defending Reeve until she ran again. The wolf kept pace with her as they reached a path up the mountain, the ground leveling into a wide trail. Reeve's bare feet on the path filled her mind with the importance the dirt road had held for generations of pilgrims. She could see them hiking through the jungle, thousands of boots and feet pounding a path to the monastery at the top of the mountain. She could hear their whispered prayers melding in dozens of different languages and dialects over hundreds of years. The monastery was now in ruins. There were no more religions on Agar. Nothing but belief in the choir. But their faith, traveling along the non-linear pathways of time and space, warmed Reeve, blocking out the taunts of the choir and her own strained gasps for breath. Halfway up the mountain, the dirt path turned to stone steps. Pebbles and chunks of the stairs crumbled as Reeve and the wolf bounded forward, but they held. Reeve grit her teeth. She was going the right way, her dreams never lied. If she could just reach the monastery, the winds would push back the songs. She would be safe. The songs bounded after her. She couldn't avoid it anymore. It had found her. Now it was just a race to safety or death. Tendrils snaked away from the clouds like octopus tentacles, reaching out to her in an attempt to throw her off the path. Reeve cried out as a slender strand of song wrapped around her leg, leaving a crimson trail of blisters across her skin. The wolf whimpered deep in her throat as another tentacle scorched her back. The stone steps gave way to another dirt path, but the slope of Reeve's path was leveling out. The first signs of wind tousled Reeve's hair, licking at her filthy skin and rags. Her breath caught in her throat. She couldn't help but close her eyes. The wind was like the first breath of air after nearly drowning, like sunlight on her face after an icy winter. The jungle canopy was thinning, dark storm clouds replacing shadowy boughs and vines. She was almost there, almost safe. The songs climbed faster, no longer a rippling bank of fog, but a creature with thousands of spider legs. It scuttled after her, the song rising in pitch and intensity as it closed in on her. 
Up ahead, the monastery came into view. Its dark stone towers stood out like a charcoal sketch against the violent storm clouds. A flash of lightning revealed massive, crumbling ruins, surrounded by leafy trees, their branches swaying in the wind. A fresh burst of hope filled Reeve with enough strength to sprint the final few steps to safety. The wind became more violent, whipping at her skin and blowing even her muddy hair into disarray. The songs shattered in the gale, torn apart, and cast to the farthest corners of the earth. The winds were the one force of nature the choir couldn't control, the one thing that could drown out and crush their destructive, manipulative songs. The winds died down as Reeve staggered to the ruins. The ancient council room, now open to the elements after its walls and ceiling had collapsed, was the eye of the mountain's storm, a spot of perfect stillness surrounded by an unbreakable barrier. Reeve collapsed to the ground. With no songs hunting her, she lost all will and ability to move. She could barely breathe. Every ache, pain, laceration, and burn came screaming back to life. But they were nothing compared to her exhaustion. I could die here. The thought caught Reeve off guard. It wasn't tainted with bitterness or hopelessness. It was simple fact. This was sacred ground, holy, safe. She had crossed continents, her search for vengeance taking her from the dank basement that had been her childhood prison to the top of a mountain on the other side of the world. She had evaded the choir for twenty-one years, since the day she was born, and first blinked up at the world with her sky-blue eyes. This could be enough for her, perhaps... This was all she was ever meant to do. The wolf limped to her and carefully laid at her side. Her warmth and softness, the trembling rise and fall of her breath, and the pound of her heart was a balm to Reeve, something to bring her back to reality, bring her back to life. Reeve reached out to her, running her unbroken hand over her coat. She had never been allowed a pet. They were too big a risk. But if the wolf wanted to stay with her, Reeve wouldn't turn her away. Perhaps there was someone who could travel with her after all. Reeve's eyes slowly closed, and her hand went limp in the wolf's fur. Still, sleep wouldn't come in the holy halls of the Triad Monastery. Reeve felt herself rising out of her body, her consciousness shedding her physical form. She was no longer encumbered by her injuries and pain. She was a ghost, a spirit with blue eyes, an astral projection walking the sliver of dimension between reality and dreams. She stood over her own body. She was contorted like a broken marionette, covered in mud, dried blood, and mottled with deep purple and black bruises. Reeves stared down at herself with disinterest. It was like watching her weakness come to life as a paralyzed lump of clay and injury. Reeve had been unimpressed with her own body and its limitations since the first day as a young adolescent she had dreamed herself into the spirit realm. Her mind, her will, was so much stronger than her prison of physicality allowed her to be. She could see the hair on her arms rise from the cold as her body slept. But even standing nude in her spirit form, she couldn't feel temperature. She had an awareness that the stones under her feet were chilled, but it didn't affect her. Her eyes narrowed to a fierce glare. Weak. You're weak. She turned on her spiritual heel, leaving herself behind, and strolled through the ruins. Every stone whispered to her, telling the story of the building's construction and destruction. Images and memories infused in the mortar came to life, layered around her like a dozen malfunctioning holograms. Generations of the faithful praying, priests and priestesses performing rituals and blessings. Reeve could see the faithful around her, transparent memories of men, women, and children. 
there were Terrans, wise changelings, and people of Agar. She even spotted a few with blue eyes. They were peasants and royals, merchants and nomads. The triad faithful didn't seem to have any prejudices among the believers. It was strict triad law that all were welcome. These were the first centers of true freedom, where everyone was treated equally, regardless of gender, race, or station. Their doctrine had soon spread. Now, even under the thrall of the choir, all residents of Agar were equal. The monastery had been a place of hope and peace. The theology of the triads had always been a religion of acceptance, promoting education, charity, and spiritual enlightenment. It had been the only belief system to take hold in every region of Agar. Belief in the triad, the three separate yet unified goddesses representing the people of Agar, Terrans, and Changelings, had only existed for three hundred years, but it had changed the landscape of the world. It had been the choir's first target when they came to power. The choir had whispered to their faithful, urging them to burn and destroy the triad temples and holy halls. The choir's songs had murdered the priests and priestesses. The triad faithful had been hunted down and destroyed, massacred in their churches. The only reason the memory of the triad still existed was the choir had programmed people to kill any remaining believers on sight. Reeves circled the main chapel, and the ruins slowly grew. Transparent bricks and mortar filled the holes in the walls, while the debris of the ceiling disappeared. The memory of the building before the choir's assault rose around her until she stood in the monastery as it had been at its prime. She turned in slow circles, marveling at the intricately painted ceiling and the runes etched into the walls. Silk curtains and blown glass lanterns cast the chapel in crimson, gold, and burnt orange. Silver trays bearing crystals, precious stones, vials of water, and sticks of incense marked places of sacrifice and ritual. Life stones were embedded in the walls, the fiery gems decorating hieroglyphs and providing places of prayer. Reeve ran her fingers over a stained glass window decorated with the image of the triad, a woman of Agar dressed in crimson silk like a nomad, a blue-eyed woman dressed in a robe of shadow, and a changeling woman dressed in leather light armor, ready for battle. They held hands, separate beings, but only complete together. Reeve heard a sharp tap echoing in the distance. It was the steady scuff of footsteps. She followed the sound past the chapel, through the sparse living chambers of the priests and priestesses, and into the most ancient part of the monastery, the library. The walls rose three times as tall as Reeve. The ceiling was a glass dome, allowing a cascade of pale blue moonlight into the chamber. Massive oak shelves were filled with every book Reeve could imagine, the leather-bound tomes detailing all of Agar's history. Despite their pristine conditions, Reeve could smell smoke and ash. The books had all been burned at the command of the choir. Possessing books that were unapproved by the choir was punishable by torture and imprisonment. They were a sign of attachment to the past, and attachment, devotion, to anything but the choir and Agar was a sign of treason. Books were holy to Reeve, a sacred symbol of revolution and rebellion. The footsteps continued at the end of the library. The sound slowly scraped against the cold stones as a middle-aged woman paced before a large window looking out over the jungle. She was small, just shorter than Reeve, her graying hair curling around her shoulders. Two other women sat nearby, an elegant nomadic woman with silver streaks in her hair wearing a silk robe, and a lithe woman with slender, ropey muscles leaning back against her chair with her feet propped up on the table. The memory was at least six hundred years old, 
more than twice as old as the monastery that must have been renovated or built around the library centuries later. Reeve instantly recognized them. The triad. They were far less magnificent than the stained glass and the hieroglyphs had led her to believe. Reeve paused and watched them, frozen in their activities. The changeling pacing the Terran-descended nomad looking out over the jungle, the mage leaning back in her chair. They were mortals, not goddesses or even demigods, just women, lovers, teachers. Reeve spotted life stones embedded in their arms. Reeve had assumed as much. She had never believed in gods and goddesses, the choir proved beings could exist outside of time and space without being creators or worthy of worship. But she had always loved the legends of the triad. It had been a sweet story as she'd grown from infant to woman in the dark of her parents' basement. Later, stories of the believers, the last few who had stood against the rise of the choir, had given her a sense of camaraderie. Reeve wasn't a believer. She was an agent of chaos, dedicated to destroying the choir, even if it cost the delicate balance and forced peace their brainwashing nanobots had brought upon the world. But she had always felt like a descendant of the Triad Rebels, those who had held true to their beliefs, even in the face of death. It was somehow both disappointing and empowering to find the Triad had once simply been mortal women. The moons rose high in the sky, both in Reeve's vision and in the physical plane. It was midnight. In the distance, Reeve could hear singing. She turned away from the imprint of the triad and returned to the chapel. Two rows of priestesses passed among the faithful, their voices rising and falling in a gentle song of rebirth and renewal. They touched the sick and the broken-hearted, carrying intricate thuribles leaking jasmine, rose, and pine-scented incense. Reeve sat on the ground beside her physical body, crossing her legs and watching the women move around her. Reeve hated singing. It reminded her of the choir songs, the melodies that had chased her across Agar since her childhood. But there was something about the priestess's songs that were truly soothing, healing. They lulled her out of the present, not to death like the choir songs, but to somewhere warm, peaceful. Somewhere her broken body would heal, and her mind could be at rest. The imprint of a priestess with short black hair knelt beside her and touched her shoulder. Reeve fell back in shock. Memories weren't intelligent. They couldn't see her. They were just a reproduction of the past. Still, the woman barely recognized her presence before moving on, leaving even Reeve's astral form tired and warm. Reeve relaxed, closing her eyes. The singing continued, now a story about a sandstorm late at night, the first meeting of the triad. The song brought a blush to Reeve's cheeks as it detailed the romance coupling and bonding of the goddesses, how they become one in the depths of the desert. Reeve wondered how the triad, the mortal women who would become goddesses in songs and stories, had truly first met. Reeve could feel herself transcending even her astral form. She was changing again, her powers growing. It was why she had dreamt of this place, been drawn across two countries to find the monastery. If she released herself to the powers of the holy halls, she would grow, become more powerful. She would be one step closer to the woman she needed to be to defeat the choir. Sleep. The command was out of time, the voice neither male nor female. The voice wasn't threatening, it was gentle almost as if spoken by the singing priestesses around her. Reeve cocked her head to the side in confusion, her eyes still closed. She was sleeping. Her physical body was completely unconscious. Dream. Reeve's lips pressed into a tight line. 
She didn't dream. She only traveled. Her mind was never at rest. Resting made her vulnerable, allowed the choir a chance to enter her mind. You are safe. Let go. Reeve felt herself rising above herself, her thoughts and focus drifting. For a moment she was gripped with terror. She couldn't let this happen. She was never safe. Safety was a lie. The wind brushed her cheeks and swept through her thick hair. The songs would never reach her through the breeze. She flexed her hand and could feel the wolf's thick fur, her muscles taut, ready to defend Reeve in case of an attack. If Reeve was ever going to relinquish her control and rest, it should be here. Stop fighting. Reeve obeyed. She laid back, allowing the darkness of true dreams to close in, dampening her incessant thoughts until she knew true stillness, true peace. Moments later, for the first time in her life, Reeve slept. <laughs>